So as I mentioned in the intro, you have done work with the emerging color photographers. You were part of a transition, a major transition really, of black and white into color, into ideas about new subjects for photography. And I'm interested in, and you're a lifetime educator, and so because there's a lot of students in the room, I'm sort of readdressing maybe what I would have asked to the context of the evening and who's here, which is what, what has, what has a, as a teacher, okay, so my question really is, you know, one used to address as a painter, let's say, this venerable tradition, what am I going to do with this medium? I want to make paintings, but the history is so daunting. One of the things that clearly in my mind comes out of the conversation that you've had about what you showed, but also the idea that the nature of everybody has a camera, everybody's taking pictures. So if you're a photographer in the art school sense, in the art world sense, what do you tell a young photographer about making work? What's the challenge in making work now for this new world where images are not just things on the wall as they are in the room behind us, but images that are, they're data. They're not just things, but they're data. And so they're immediately sendable. They're being made for various platforms. So in a sense, what does it take to be a good photographer now? I, there's no answer to the question because there's so many different kinds of photography now. It's, um, I think the first thing, and I teach in a couple of MFA programs now, and the first thing I want to know is why people are making pictures in the first place. And, and you want to find out like what's the passion behind that in terms of making images, looking at images, and as importantly at this point is using images because there are, so, photography because it reaches into so many of our lives, there are a lot of different photography worlds, right? You know, within the 1970s alone, right? If you kind of chart the, my experience, right? I started out working in an art photography gallery. Then I went to an art gallery that showed photography, right? And then I went to trying to deal with like a generation, you know, of, of image makers like Richard Prince and Cindy Sherman, Laurie Simmons, and the whole picture generation thing were basically saying, we're not photographers, right? So that all happened in 10 years, right? And that kind of suggested where things are going to. And I, you know, I sit and I talk to students now, and we look at work, and we look at, I look at websites, I look at, you know, people bring things in on iPads, I'll look at stuff on the phone all the time. But um, I think what you need to, if you're, if, if people are wanting to, make pictures and live lives in and through and around photography, you've got to really think about why you're making the pictures, right? What, what you want those images to do and, and, and who your audience is, because I think there's multiple audiences now. I think, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, um, there was this fantasy, certainly in terms of the MFA circuit, that you go to graduate school, get in debt, come out, um, if you'd be like really lucky, some gallery would swoop you up and you'd have a career, right? Or you'd be lucky enough to get a teaching position and that would be what you could do. Now it's like all bets are off. It's like everybody's got an MFA and who do you want to talk to? And what does photography mean to you? Does, you know, is photography some, you know, are you taking pictures on your phone and doing projects on Facebook, you know? I know people have, you know, switched from making print-based things and are doing Facebook projects. So I think you, everybody needs to take a step back who's engaged in this medium and this practice and really think about how they, what it means to them and why they love it and how they want to use it. Because I think that there is no single, that's what I was saying before, there is no single story about photography. There is no single photography world. Um, and in a funny sense, there never was. at the book, the, the breadth of it and the width of it, mm -hmm. the everything of it, mm -hmm. feels like it's a, it's a bit like this star that's just exploding in all these different directions, right? Where, is it infinite? Does it just keep going? Does some parts of that start reflecting backwards? Like, where is this heading? What, 
what happens? A uh, future question, essentially. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I know they haven't been involved in the photography world for starting to seem like a really long time, right? It's like this is the most interesting time in terms of photography that I've seen since the 1970s, right? In that the opportunities for image making, image sharing, rethinking what images are, photographs are, we've never had this before, right? And so there, and so there are, you know, there are different worlds and different communities. So is this exploding? Yes. Is it like exploding in a way that you can't deal with it? No. You know, you choose to, you choose who you talk to, right? But what I know is that like, and this is me coming out of the art world and coming out of the photography world, it's like for all the thought talk of images, you know, and people making work that challenges this or challenges that, right? All of a sudden, like I'm looking at pictures that are, cha that are life and death pictures, right? And like, and, I'm, and so I'm thinking, you know, it's one thing to like make art and, and make a case for it. It's another thing to live or die by a picture. And I think it's an interesting thing to talk about. It's an interesting thing to decide what is photography now. There's guys up at MIT who are involved in what's called computational photography who are basically saying, well, you know, why do we think photography is what photography, what we've come to know is photography? The same way I look at the MFA students I teach with and think, why are you all making color pictures? Why are you all working with view cameras? Why are you all matting them the same way? Why are you all framing them the same way, right? What's, you know, there's like an orthodoxy around photography that needs to be questioned. So people up at MIT are basically saying, why do pictures have to be sharp? Why do they have to be full of details? Why can't we make pictures that have 20% of the information in, that, in them that regular conventional pictures have? And we have sharpening programs. We can bring it up to 95%, you know, of what it needs to be. So I think people are changing what photography is. And I think that's, to me, is like the really interesting discussion. And, 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 and also how it's being used in social media and how, the, how photography has become a, it, well, it, it always has been a tool of communication, but now more than ever, right? People, people are making photographs. And if you ask them why they make them, they can't even necessarily tell you. They make them. Because they're curious, it's like Gary Winogrand who said, you know, I want to make photographs because I want to see what things look like in photographs. And now, you know, a billion people a day are doing, doing that, that, you know, all the time. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, do we have a mic out here? Question? Uh, I was just wondering if you could talk briefly about uh, the capacity for visual literacy, how that's utilized by youth and also non professionals without talking about. Without talking about teaching to the test, like, well, it's like there's a reason. There's a reason that I said that. I did. We did a talk in New York last week at Aperture, right? And uh, and a lot of the projects I've done, I've kind of reached out to people who are not artists or photographers to talk about the medium, right? And and you, we are we all live in an image world where images have a lot of power. And even though we're not taught specifically about it, we've got we're pretty visually sophisticated, or many people are more than people think, right? But if you look at how photography is being used now and how kids are taking pictures, you know, from the time they're like two and three years old, right, and kind of get what cameras are, you need to be talking about visual literacy. And visual literacy is usually, visual literacy, visual culture has kind of become a code word for art historians to make themselves sound relevant in a world where imaging is changing. And so, and, and the fact is that in schools, people really do teach two tests and there are no art classes anymore, right? And so if you wanted to talk, people, images play such a big role in, in, in our lives now that, um, you know, I mean, Bruce mentioned this, this project I'm doing called Why We Look. And I decided, I used to do a lot of blogging for the Smithsonian when I was doing this project. And when, I, when this project stopped, I started this Twitter project in, in April. And every day I'm like reading through uh, articles on the web from journals and newspapers about how visual imaging works in the world. And one of the articles I came across basically said, it was an article written for parents and it said, have you had the talk yet, right? And the talk wasn't the birds and the bees talk, right? The talk was the sexting talk, right? The talk was how, how, what's the, how do you deal with imaging and social media? How do, you, how do you have that conversation with your 
12 year old, 10 year old, you know, whatever, right? And you realize nobody's talking about this, right? And so from my perspective, it's like, how do you get vis the visual literacy discussion out there, right? And in the course of working on this project, I would read stories about people who, like there was a school teacher in Chicago who had a fifth grade class and she got a $15,000 grant from, you know, or it was money and stuff from a local camera store when there were local camera stores. And she used photography to teach math. So she took the kids out on the Chicago River and they photographed buildings and talked about geometry. She used photography to teach history. She used it to teach everything, right? That doesn't happen much and it should. And the, pro and the reason it doesn't happen, we found out af at, after this discussion um, when somebody who was there who was a principal in um, schools in the New York City system basically said, the problem is you're calling it art. I said, stop calling it art. If you stop calling it art and you say the visual literacy is essential to literacy, you'll get better, you'll get, you'll get further. So in fact, you know, based on that two weeks ago, we're gonna try to do that and, and test it out. But I think visual literacy is enormously important. And if you're teaching visual literacy, what are you saying it's important to know about pictures, right? So you need to know, all, you know, there's, list, there's lots of photographic theory out there. There's lots of people who've written on all of these issues um, that, that raise um, important ideas about this. It's like you got to teach people to ask questions about images, right? Who made them? Why do they look the way they do? Why do we encounter them where we encounter them? What do people think is going to happen to us from seeing them? And I think those, are, and, and why do we take pictures ourselves? I mean, literally, I got this, this, one of the guys who wrote for this book was a guy named Steve Hoffenberg who was an image analyst for a lot of um, electronics companies, right, and was doing a lot of research about this. And so you know, I asked him, like, well, why, if, if so many people are taking pictures, why are they taking pictures? And he said, they don't know. They don't know. So I think they should. I think, you know, I think we all should. So that's, that's the visual literacy thing. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think there's a parallel there with the written word and sort of the explosion of the written word, even the number of texts that people send. And it used to be something to be published. Now, you can self-publish pretty easily. Does that explosion of images like text, does that increase the importance of an editor or a curator or somebody to help wade through the expanse? Sure. Everybody is a curator, right? It's like, you know, I mean, I read, I read articles about people curating closets. It's, it's it, you know, it, you, you need... All of us need to be curators. This is the other thing. If everybody's a photographer, everybody also needs to be a curator. Everybody needs to be a photo editor, right? Everybody's got to make those kind of decisions. And yeah, I think, um, I, I, at, on the one hand, I think it's extraordinary. The opportunities are incredible for getting images out, right? You, people can set up websites, they can do, projects, they can distribute, you know, images, and you're right, they, you can do it with text, you know, as well. How you couch those, how you phrase those is enormously important. So, yeah, I think that that's a huge issue. I mean, another issue is how do you deal with all the images that are out there? How do you, I mean, when I was at the Smithsonian, when, after the photography initiative ended in 2010, I worked for the Smithsonian Archives for a year, and was work, kind of creative director to their blog and writing about storage and archives and whatever. And they took me into a room at the Smithsonian Archives where they have every PC and desktop computer that ever exists, right? The idea being that, you know, how are you gonna go back and get this information? Well, that happens to pictures too, right? And so photographs made on the moon are no longer visible because NASA, neither NASA nor anybody else has the playback equipment for some of that stuff. So there's all of those. I mean, in terms of these, these curatorial issues and there's the storage issues, which are really interesting. Yeah. 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 Hi. Can you hear me? OK. Um, I was just thinking about you know how people re remember in photographs can you contrast with that with video? You know, what is people, it, content aside, what is the difference between, you know, looking at a photograph, relating to one, remembering them versus, you know, uh, moving images 
Is anyone studying that, or is there any thought about that? Still versus video? Yeah. Yeah, people think about that a lot. There was a project I did years ago, it was uh, mid-1990s, that actually was in Atlanta. It was at the, at the High Art Museum. It was called Talking Pictures, and in it, um, uh, we interviewed a, a lot of people. One of them was Eddie Adams, who made the famous picture from the Vietnam War of the South Vietnamese uh, general, you know, shooting that guy in the head, right? Okay. Eddie made that picture, and this was a project where we asked people to talk about the pictures that changed their lives. And, we, and it was another one of these great encyclopedic projects. So I got to interview Miss America and Rosa Parks and, you know, and, and Eddie Adams, right? So you're, you're hoping, right, Eddie Adams is going to talk about this picture, right? And Eddie Adams said about that picture and said about other, pic well, he said about that picture and he said it a number of times, like, that picture ruined my life and it ruined the life of the people in it, right? But what's interesting about that picture is he was standing next to a, um, a cameraman from, I think it was NBC, who was shooting video, right, at the same time. And you look at that picture, which becomes this iconic thing, right? And you look at the moving images of it, which happen like that, right, and get very complicated in terms of, you know, blood and death in ways that are really hard to process. And you realize that still photography, even in the midst of all of this moving imagery, still has a very powerful place and a very powerful role. And how we remember stuff, I mean, that's like a, I don't know the answer to that, you know? I mean, I tried with this project literally to find people, you know, I'd call up places like the NYU Institute for the Brain and would say, well, how do you, what's the difference between looking at a photograph of something and looking at the thing? How, you know, how do we see it differently? How do we remember it differently? And we, people don't know that. And I, I think the still versus moving image thing is something that needs a lot more work on it. But Eddie Adams' response to that picture was, that picture is always there. If you want to look at the video, this is before YouTube, right? You have to like go find the tape and have a place to watch it. But I think that still images, and this goes back to what I was saying before about needing to understand how they work. It's like, what happens when you look at a picture? How much do you see? How much can you see at any given time? What narrative do you create for that in your head? What, would, what different narrative would you create if you looked at it five years later or 10 years later or 30 years later? So there's this incredible thing around photography and photographs that we tend not to talk about. It's like, what does it mean to see a picture on the wall? You know, walk into this show. What is it, if people walk through museums and spend seven seconds looking on average at everything they see, right, how much are you seeing, right? What's the difference, what would be the difference in looking at one of these Laurel Nakadati pictures in a book, right? Or seeing it on screen, right? And those, I think, are issues that people just need to figure out. So I think the still versus the moving is part, of, also part of, this of understanding, you know, how we see things. I mean, there are people doing research where they'll um, do brain scans of people as they're watching video clips of specific things, right? Like a kitten, right? You know, it's always a kitten, or like, you know, or whatever, right? Uh, you know, or a balloon in the sky, and they'll kind of to the equivalent of fMRIs of their brain activity. And it's gotten to the point now where you can quantify that and take people's brain waves and guess what the images are that they're seeing, right, from them. If you ask them, if you ask them to imagine something and you can, you can track the, the electronic signals, you can figure out what they're seeing. All of this is like to come, which is part of what makes this all really interesting too. So it's a long, it's a long answer to your question. But. curated in a moving image the story is curated because there's other images that send you in a direction yeah. and a still picture is is left uh, for you to you to tell that story the story may be started yes but with a still photograph uh, it's a different kind of storytelling yeah yeah and there's lots of photographers who talked about it Stephen Shore says it Often a lot of people do. It's like photographs tell things. They don't. They show you things. They they show you things. They don't tell you things, right? I mean, that's the point of it. And I think you're right. That narrative idea is implicit in moving images. I remember 
when I was working at Light Gallery early on, and truly in the early 1970s, was like a handful of people were interested in looking at photographs. And so part of what's fun about like working in galleries or being a curator is the kind of conversations you can generate around images. So at that point, since the audience was so tiny, you could hang out and talk to people about pictures and try to gauge what they were thinking and get them excited. And I was talking to one person who, you know, I was talking, I don't remember what we were looking at, right? But I was like going on and on about photography and she just said to me, you know, photographs make me nervous. And I thought, okay, right? And I had no idea what she was talking about, right? And it only like dawned on me, oh, I don't know, five years ago, 10 years ago, as I was in the middle of some kind of discussion about the indexicality of photography and like all the information that's in photographs. Photographs make people nervous, right? In a certain, I mean, too, there's so much information in pictures that unless they organize themselves into narratives you already know and understand, you can get lost in them, right? And, and so they're tricky. Photographs are tricky that way. And, um, and that's also another, it goes back to the visual literacy thing. literacy thing. It's like, why are pictures made? Why do they look the way we do? Why did somebody frame a picture the way they framed it? So I think it's, it's part of, a, it's a similar discussion, but I, I think you're right. I think when there's a story or a narrative implied, it changes pictures. Look at how pictures are used in, or, or you know, well, were used in, uh, in newspapers and magazines, right? And needed captions. I mean, look at captioning versus no captioning. It's you know a kind of extraordinary kind of thing. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thanks for your presentation. It's really um, timely and relevant. Um, uh, apropos the question of Eddie Adams, one of the things that I think is beautiful about that example is that if you actually look at the footage uh, of the NBC cameraman. <clears throat> At the instant that Adam, Adams' picture is made, a figure passes in front of the lens of the cameraman. So you, in fact, don't see that instant, which is the instant of his picture. There's, a, an, a, a, there's a, um, an eclipse, if you want, mm -hmm. of the narrative that is only filled in because it happened that Eddie Adams, the photographer, was also standing there making a picture and made one just then. Anyway, I have, a, I have a thought in my mind that I want to try to articulate um, and ask you about. And it has to do with the question of genre, something I've been thinking about for a long time. If your book were titled, Writing Changes Everything, and you told us words can be used to make poems, and they can be used to make ledger book accounts, and they can be used to, to write newspaper articles, and so on and so forth, we would shrug. It wouldn't be news to us, right? And we don't even think that all these different uses of language should be bundled together and described as an extraordinary thing, that language can be used to do all these things. When it comes to photography, it is a little marvelous to think that photography is used for these different purposes. So my question is, would you say that what we're entering is a period in which we can begin to talk about photographic genres but in fact, your cha the chapters of your book name genres which in a, another generation will be so self-evident that the title of your book is, causes us to shrug in the same way that we would shrug if the title were writing changes everything. Or is the problem that you can never really come up with photographic genres because pictures keep changing places within those genres. So that the genres themselves keep reorganizing themselves depending on what we actually do with those pictures. And the question? That is my question. Is our <laughs> And the question is? <laughs> well, the question is, are, uh, can you describe, the, would you describe the moment that we're in as, as one in which photographic genres are emerging or are not emerging? Or the photographic genre is, uh, is a nonsensical idea, a nonsensical No, I, I think it's not a nonsensical idea, but I think the definitions of those genres are changing, right? Take portraiture, right? I mean, so you can, 
you know, you can take a picture of me or I can take a picture of you, right? But is medical photography portraiture, you know, is the photograph that you will be able to take of your face and be able to send to your doctor who will scan it for color and pigmentation and be able to tell what your blood pressure is, right? Is that portraiture, right? So is landscape, what's landscape photography, right? Is landscape photography, uh, Robert Adams and Louis Baltz, is it, you know, um, Moybridge, is it, you know, 19th century, is landscape photography. Last week I was at the University of Maryland talking to um, scientists, research scientists who's got a room full of drones that are circulating over the University of Maryland taking pictures of the, um, of all of the tops of trees because he's doing a study on carbon dioxide, right? And so I'm looking at the imaging that he's creating, right, with this on this project, and it's a God's eye view, right, down from heavens, right, or whatever you think is up there, right, through, right, the drone flight paths, right? So you see the drone flight path there with, with the mark where every photograph was taken, like 2,000 photographs in a couple of minutes, let's say, and then all the photographic stuff tiled out underneath it. Is that landscape photography, right? So I think the new, the new uh, uses of photography are changing the old genres. I think there's always gonna be, we're always gonna want pictures of people and places and things. We're always gonna want to learn things through photography. We're always gonna want to, look at the things that people tell us we're not supposed to look at. Um, I think those things will stay the same. I think the way images are made, the way we receive them is all gonna change. I mean, I like, can't wait, right, till Google Glasses start projecting pictures on the other side of these, right? Or maybe I can, I don't know what it's gonna be like, but I'm interested in that. That's gonna change everything, right? Um, so no, I think the genres, stay. I mean, and maybe there'll be new genres too, but I think, I think they're there for a reason. I mean, it's trying to explain the world to ourselves and what's the world? Does, I don't know. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah. What's your favorite food? <laughs> My favorite food? If I had to like pick anything, soup dumplings. <laughs> What's yours? Um, I really like scallops and shrimp. Uh huh. Do you take pictures of food? Uh, occasionally. And do you do you send it out? Or are you like? No, I eat it. No, but the <laughs> you, I'm, I'm asking if you if you're like one of the food people, foodies who like takes pictures of everything they eat and then sends it out to people. Mm -hmm. I wonder if um, if the more photography changes everything, if, if actually the more it stays the same. And I'm, I'm thinking about um, oral traditions, and then you were talking about writing and, and its analogies to photography. And, and we've always had a need to tell stories, and and that doesn't seem to necessarily be changing with these changes in photography. We still have a need. To right. tell stories and to hear stories or to read stories or to see stories. I mean, is it the more it changes, the more it stays the same? Absolutely. I mean, you go back to the origins of photography, right? And you look at how the medium was used and who used it. And just like everybody's taking pictures today, the first photographers were dentists and plumbers and gentlemen farmers and whoever you know, kind of got curious about it and who's involved in technology. And the same kinds of images that we're making today, we made, people made back then. I think what happens is the conversation about photography gets commandeered by people certain kinds of stories. So you'll have, you know, the photojournalist, you know, story, photojournalism story about photography and concern photography and humanism. You'll have the art photography story and even that'll change. If you go back, I was um, working on a project, um, doing research on photography in the 1970s to try to get a sense of what was going on at the time and why what happened in photography happened. And I read an interview with Beaumont Newhall from 1980, right, where he's talking, he's, he's, and this was published in After Image. And, and uh, Chuck Hagen was interviewing him and he asks him, uh, 
he asks him, like, what's important in terms of imaging at this point? And he says, video. Okay? He says video in 1980, right? And then he goes back and he describes how when he wrote the history of photography book that was for many years the book, right, about the history of photography, it was, um, it, it, it was Catholic in its taste. It, like, talked about science. It talked about medicine. It talked about all the kinds of stuff that this book talks about, right? What, and then what he said that what happened was the more popular the book became, right, and the more it sold at the Museum of Modern Art, the more he was pressured to focus on the Museum of Modern Art's collection, right, and edit out that other stuff, right? And so there goes the history of photography, right? Or there it goes into like this corner of the room, right? And so I think your point's right. I think the world is the world. Our engagement with it is, you know, ongoing. Our curiosity about what are, you know, who are we and what's going on, right, is always there. And photography is an extraordinary tool to to do that, right? And it's always been that way, and it still is that today. And I think that um, I think people are starting to you know explore that in their own practice, right? Whether they're artists or photographers or you know just people with their cell phones. So, yeah, I think it was I think it was always the case. And I think you can argue, yeah, language changes everything too. But I think people understand language in a different kind of way. And people understand that there are poets, and there are fiction writers, and there are nonfiction writers. And people don't tend to make necessarily, or didn't in the past, make such distinctions about photography. It was like, it's true, right? This is it. So I think we're, it's part of that rethinking of the medium going on now, too. Do you think about the difference between the truthfulness of the image and the, the factual qualities of the image? Do you, do you make a distinction between those two? Because you talked about the picture of the child with the smile. Mm -hmm. Pictures. I think photography is fluid, right? This uh, this belief that you go out and take a, a photograph and it shows you the world in its truthfulness means you see the world given the optics of the camera you've got and the output tools that you have, right? I mean, and and the show that just opened at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York last week called Faking It, you know, goes back to the beginning of photography and says, hey, the stuff, you know, photographs have been telling the stories from the beginning, and we've been manipulating them for the start. You talk to scientists, right, about how they take the imagery that they work with, right, which often is based on, you know, lasers, you know, lasers transmitting electronic information that's processed through algorithms that creates an image of it, and then you have to decide, like, what color should this image be, right? How am I going to tell, like, where this blood vessel is, what's the best way to understand the relationship of this star to that star from 20 billion years ago. So scientists are manipulating images all the time. So I think the, the truthfulness thing, I think, made everybody feel good. And it's like, you know, I mean, we would like to believe in certain kinds of things, but I think people, you know, everybody, not everybody, but lots of people, you know, I think, talk about the fact that the truth aspect of photography is, um, blown, right, to smithereens at this point. And, and, and you kind of know which ways is truthful and you know which ways is not, which is another case to talk about visual literacy issues. So. Um, yeah. OK, I guess. OK. Um, how do you think photography and images are really changing our concept of sight and what it really means to see? Um, when we talk about new advancing medical technologies, for example, the you know glasses nowadays that you know, have wires that go directly into someone's brain and attach to electrodes in their brain and allow them to see. You know, how does that sort of technology and imagery change what it means to actually see something? And how is it impacting our conceptions of sight? It's, I, it's, a, it's a great question. It's something I'm completely interested in, right? I mean, there are the same way that there are people reading brainwaves and playing back the movies that you see in your head, right? There are people who are implanting um, the same kind of image receptors that you have in your cell phone or camera, implanting miniaturized versions of that on the retinas of people who've lost their sight, right? And so they're creating vision, they're recreating vision, or you know, creating it people that don't have it. I think that the that looking at photographs gives you information about the world and changes the way you see the world. So medical imagery is certainly that. I mean, look at, um, look at 
what happened with sonograms, right? I mean, look at what happens um, with all kinds of medical imaging, right? I mean, look at, you know, you, you, go, you could go to the doctor and have x-rays taken and they're emailed to India and radiologists over there, like, read them and, you know, get back to you, you know, on it. So it's certainly changing that. I think when you start, if you think about the Leonard Nielsen photographs of an embryo, right, in development that were run in Life magazine in the 1960s, right? Nobody had ever seen that before. That changed the way people saw, right? I mean, that changed the way people thought about themselves and the way they looked at, um, you know, all kinds of imaging and, and the world. So I think the scientific aspects to me are among the most interesting. There's people now um, figuring out how to take pictures around corners, right? You can have a camera that measures bounce light waves. You know, I can send the laser over to that door over there. It'll bounce to the other side of the building. It'll bounce around a whole bunch of times. It'll come back and you process it through algorithms and you can make an image of the chair that's in Stewart's office, like back over there, right? So I think, think about drones, right? I mean, drones are, you know, think about seeing things you can't see. Think about night vision, right? Think about how that changed warfare. Think about how that changed surveillance. Think about the police using license plate readers that can read your license plate at 90 miles an hour, right, from a distance of hundreds of feet and within seconds can have your whole history of parking tickets and anything about you available like that as their car is moving and your car is moving, right? So what we see is like, it's, it's kind of incredible. And I think what happens is you start just as photographs became extensions of our eye, the more photography extends, the more we see in a funny kind of way. So I think it's a, it's a really, it's a, it's a big thing. Yeah. Uh, why did you write a book instead of making a photograph, ph photography book? And can you explain um, your decision uh, and also the relationship between probably images and words and how they, what roles they play in sustaining the, I don't know, perhaps the institution of photography. I, well, I mean, the reason this book is so text heavy, right, is that it comes out of those conversations I was having with people um, it, it, in the, castle that day when I was meeting with those people I spoke about or other conversations I had. There's this assumption that because we all look at photographs, we all see the same thing and we all respond the same way. You know, there are people who believe that photography is a universal language and in some ways it is and in some ways it isn't, right? And I think that to start understanding how images work, you got to talk about them. And they're hard they can be difficult to talk about because we're not, going back to the visual literacy thing, we're not trained to talk about them. I mean, I remember that Talking Pictures project that I mentioned when we asked people to think about the picture that changed their lives. One person we talked to was a, was a woman who was a police officer in New York City who I think helped start one of the child abuse um, programs there. And she picked the famous Eugene Smith walk to paradise picture, right? It's a very famous photograph of two little kids holding hands and like walking through this tunneled space in, from darkness into light. And you know, you, you would sit down with somebody like that and say, okay, what's this picture about? And they'd say, well, you know, there are these two little kids and they're holding hands and they're walking through the forest and um, they're walking into the light. And that would be the end of it. And then you'd say, okay, what else, right? And you start like talking about that picture. We talked to that woman for six hours about that picture, right? And so photographs can take you to extraordinary places and it's only by extended looking and thinking and talking about them that you um, kind of understand them, you know? If you look at Roland Barthes' book, Camera Lucida, right? It's like one of the most interesting books around and he's looking at a little snapshot of his mother, right, that he kind of comes upon and a whole book about photography and memory and death kind of comes out of it. And it's a lot of words about a single picture and it's an extraordinary thing. So I think that's why this happened. There's, if you want to look at books and pictures, 
there's zillions of places to look at those, you know. And basically, you know, they're they're out there, and there's museums full of them, and there's archives full of them, and you know, and I love looking at them like everybody else does, and and that's that's you know that's great. But I think to really we take photographs so much for granted that I think we need to check ourselves and and start to ask some questions about how they operate. So that's that that's that's why this happened. And the idea was really to talk about a lot to a lot of different people. And a lot of the people I called up is like the spider guy, right? It was like I called him up and you know, I called up a guy who I read about in Wired magazine, a guy named Yo Stam, who is the um, inventor of Maya software, which is the software that's at the basis of special effects in the movies. And I don't remember what movie I had seen. It was like was an avatar because it was like before that. But I was like fascinated by the special effects thinking, how photographic do we want special effects to be? How real, right? So we talk about movies and images, like how real do we want this to be? So I called up this guy, right, who's created, won two Oscars for like making the software. And I said, how photographic do we want special effects to be? How real is real, right? What's, what's reality? And he too said, oh, nobody ever asked me that question. Let me think about it. And he did, and he wrote a piece for the book where he looks at a 17th century Dutch painting of a OSHA, of the ocean, right, with a lot of waves on it and a big ship kind of bobbling around. And he looks at a photograph of the ocean that he made, and he looks at a computer graphics image of the ocean and comes to the conclusion that in terms of special effects, we don't, we don't want it to be so realistic. We want a caricature. We want, we want to get it fast. We want to get to the heart of it. It's got to be convincing enough, right? And if you go back to um, uh, the idea that you need to sit and look at a picture for a long time to understand it, I, I think that's because we think we know pictures. We think we know how they operate. And so part of the reason for doing this book was to start raising these issues. And instead of me being like the sole author saying, photography has many voices, right? I thought, all right, I'm gonna go reach out to a lot of different people who have a lot of different perspectives on this and let's hear what they have to say about it. And so that's the reason to do this this way. If you look at a book, if I, you know, if I as a curator, um, let's say if, you know, if I am working on a project that's a one person show, it's like my job to represent the artist in the best possible way. If I do a show that's like a thematic kind of project, it's my responsibility to, to do uh, to deal with the issues and ideas in it the, in the best possible way. And this seemed to me like the best possible way. And it was an interesting thing. We, this pr probably, well, I mean, I've done a project like this as an exhibition where you literally heard people's voices talking about pictures, but this was, this was similar too. So I think that, yeah, we love looking at pictures. I like nothing more than looking at pictures, but I think we gotta like talk about them. Martin, you, can I just jump in for a quick second? Yeah. You, you mentioned a couple of people already, um, Jeff Batchen being one, yeah. Susan Sontag being another. Yeah. Um, who else? Uh, uh, Roland Barth. Yeah. Um, and obviously your book goes to the kinds of people who are not usually asked, which is what's so right. spectacular about it. But for a range of you know, audience members, which is pretty diverse, could you mention some other people in terms of people who've written about photography, who've changed your own thoughts about photography over the years, whose works just have been inspiring to you, may still be interesting to you to keep wrestling with their, their writing about photography? There's a, there's a woman in England who wrote a piece for the project named Elizabeth Edwards. Um, and Heidi Geismar, who I mentioned, was a student of hers. And Heidi told me about Elizabeth. They, she and a woman named Janice Hart wrote a book years ago called Photographs, Objects, Histories. That's about photographs as material objects, right? And they reached out to a bunch of people in various fields. Jeff Batchen's one of them, but they talked to anthropologists. They talked to people running all kinds of museums. That book is a really interesting book. And that book also kind of turned me around because one of the other issues, and we haven't really gone there so much now is the, this whole issue around materiality. I mean, the moving image versus still image thing starts to talk about it. But, you know, what is a photograph at this point, right? And so Elizabeth Edwards is an interesting person, right, to read about it. John Tagg is interesting, right? He writes about representation. Really hard book to read and kind of worth it to plug through as much as you can plug through. Um, 
There are a lot of people who write interestingly about photography, but my problem is that most of them, you know, people like Jeff Dyer is great, right? But again, they're writing about photography and art, and like I'm kind of done with that. So that's so so my um, my interest is like all these other people who are out there defining this other stuff, right? So I would say, yeah, I would say read the newspaper. I would say I would say do what I do, like you know, go online and just like use photography and surveillance as as um, as keywords and see what you come up with because I think I think the dialogue about where the medium is going and what's important is not is is not coming from the conventional places. Much of the uh, conversation uh, surrounding the um, the circumstance of photography focuses to vision and sight and matters relating to optics and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and and a, a, a fair percentage of tonight's conversation focused to that also. I, I'm wondering what your thoughts might be about the place of rhetoric with respect to the study of photography and how um, in contemporary practices, wherever that might be, whatever your context is in terms of how you employ photography, how would uh, the uh, circumstance of photographs to persuade or otherwise inform or otherwise discover might be changing? Give me that again. Um, with respect to r rhetoric, the idea that a photograph can persuade mm -hmm. or inform right. or otherwise um, discover. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm wondering what your thoughts might be with respect to that in terms of contemporary times and uh, as things change, are changing. You mean other ways that photographs that we can engage with them or other uses? Right. Rather than uh, discussing the nature of the photograph as, as uh, with respect to optics, with respect to vision mm -hmm. and sight, mm -hmm. um, with respect to the, uh, the, the matter of photographs and the use of photographs to persuade or inform or otherwise discover. Mm -hmm. I'm still not on, maybe it's just me. <laughs> maybe it's just, give me an example. Can you give me an example of like what you're thinking about? The spider person. The spider person is uh, right. taking a picture to understand some, some right. matter, some phenomenon. Right. Or the, uh, the overhead uh, surveillance system over the University right. of Maryland right. to discover something about the carbon emissions of, right. the, uh, of the forest. Right. So the, 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 um, the result of that work is the production of photographs or some photographic phenomenon. It, it part of it, yeah. Right. yeah. But uh, those photographs are utilized. They're utilized in some purpose. Yes. yes. You, you know, which, uh, within, within which there is uh, a rhetorical condition, a yeah. matter to persuade. Right. So uh, I'm, I'm wondering what your thoughts might be about that, about the, the space of photography as, a, as an expanding opportunity to inform or converse or discover. I think it's central to what people do. And what happens to those pictures is, I mean, you know, the guy who was doing the drone pictures, right, that I was mentioning the other day. So I said, all right, how do you how do you deal with all of this information, right? Like, what are you going to do with all of this stuff, right? And they'll store it for a while for as long as they need it until they figure out what they want to do. So I think we're creating all kinds of images that are useful, right? And what happens to them, you know, or what happens when someone else looks, I mean, what happens when someone else looks at them is an interesting thing. Um, so I think part of the issue is where do all these pictures go, right? I mean, that's going to become one of the biggest issues around, right? You can't like deal with all of these pictures, right? What do you do with all of these pictures? Um, so that's something that I've been, you know, interested in. But um, I think, you know, these, these photographs work in various ways, right? And some people are going to use them in certain ways and other people look at them differently and some people will save them and some people are going to change what photography is so it does something different, right, than what we need it to do now, which kind of goes back to the computational photography stuff. Yeah. I think we have time for one last question. So, sure. You want to go back there? I got to make it a good.
good one. Um, I would just, speaking of digital manipulation and other things, I would just love to hear your thoughts on, you know, we have these amazing technological devices and pretty much everyone, everyone under the age of 30 um, is sort of um, making it look like a Polaroid. I'd love to know your thoughts on like nostalgia and Instagram, Hipstamatic, et cetera. Um, it's a really interesting issue, right? I mean, the Instagram thing is uh, an interesting phenomenon. It's like, let's make things look like, now that we have digital pictures, let's make things look like old pictures, right? And I think there's, a, sorry, there's definitely nostalgia involved with it, and for good reason, right? Uh, there's um, there's uh, a lot of people who are doing projects around finding old pictures and then holding them up in the site where they were taking and re-photographing them and you know, kind of revisiting um, photography in that kind of way. I think people are, um, it, it goes back to the materiality question, right? I think people kind of long for that in a certain kind of way. That same image analyst guy that I mentioned, um, when I was curious about who is printing photographs at this point, because you read often that people are printing out fewer and fewer pictures. So I'm thinking, well, who's printing them out, right? Um, because you can see them, send them, store them, save them, you know, do whatever you want digitally. And he said the biggest, uh, the, the biggest demographic group that prints out photographs now are 20-somethings with kids, because they don't think those pictures are going to be there when their kids grow up, right? That social media, where all the stuff is parked, right, the cloud that you put your pictures in, may or may not be there, right? So I think it's part of the same thing. I think part of why we love photography is because we're mortal. And I think photography lets us grasp onto something that is so spectacular and so overwhelming, right? And it does it so beautifully, right? That we are never not kind of mesmerized by it. It's never not magical. And I think you want to hold that because everything is so ephemeral. Right, I think so. There's like this nostalgia for these like touchable things, right? Is I think I think part of it is that, and I think part of it is control. I think you know, in a world where people think things are out of control, it's nice to make the sky bluer. You know, it's nice to make your skin clearer. It's nice to like, you know, do whatever you want to do to make things look the way you want to make them. But I think I think it's a really. I, I used to read all the time about you know photography and. Photography and photography and memory you read about a lot in photography and death, right? And and I think it's interesting because when you you know when I was younger I thought ah whatever, right? And then the older I get, the more I realize oh yeah, right? This is like this is part of it too, right? This is like a way of grabbing onto something that is ungraspable, and whether it's a person or a place or a knowledge, I think that's that, that's part of what it's about. So going back to you know this kind of manipulation of stuff, I think people, um, yeah, people want to go back to that place. They want to go back to like the little simple snapshot. You want to go back to the Polaroid. You want to go back to the process of photography. I mean, there's lots of photographers who bitch and moan about you know the you know it's like no more dark rooms no more film no more this no more that and like that kind of magical quality of it is is evaporating to us you know to a certain extent so i think it's i think it's part of that i think it's people want to hold on to that so i think we need to end on the wanting to hold on to things and i would suggest that if you want to hold on to one of marvin's books you now have an opportunity to do so. I would tell you that this book had a print run of 4,000 copies and is already sold out. So we literally have, I think, maybe the last 20, 25 copies that are grasped out of New York. We brought them here. If you'd like them, if you'd like them uh, to be signed, Marvin will do that in, in the next 15 minutes or so, 20 minutes. And um, I want to really, Marvin, beautiful talk. Thank, Thank you, you so much for being here. Thanks.